Okay, great. Thank you. Wonderful. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay. I have no idea. Yeah, no. I know. I I know that. Okay. So the speaker today is Kevin Santos, who will speak on intro to group theory to puzzles. Thank you, Kevin. Oh, okay. Uh, should I should I start? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Uh, well, uh, thanks to everyone for coming, and thanks to the organizers for having me. Um, uh, today, yeah, I will be talking about uh, introduction to pretty elementary group theory stuff, and I'm going to apply that to uh, some fun puzzles. Uh, so hopefully, uh, this is going to be fun. Um, I'll try to make it fun. Uh, but before we start, like, let me just go over what I'll be talking about. So the main question of group theory is, what is a group? And I'll go over some introductory concepts with groups, and then I'll apply those to these three puzzles I have right here. Um, Peg Solitaire, the 15 puzzle, and the Rubik's Cube. Um, oh, before I get into it, uh, if there are any questions, just uh, you can interject or just type them in the chat and I'll the chat. be able to address them. Um, okay, so let's start. So what is group theory. Well, the mathematical object that is a group is a set, along with a way of combining the objects in that set that fulfills certain properties. So um, groups provide one of the main foundations for the field of what's known as abstract algebra. And it's an example of an algebraic structure from which we can build some other algebraic structures. Um, Groups are basically uh, a way of adding structure to a set, and that lets it be easy to manipulate the objects in that set in a uh, useful and predictable way. Um, so one of the main, one of the first uh, examples of a group that's usually brought up in a group theory class is the example of the symmetries of a square. So let's think about like, what are some of the symmetries of the square and uh, what are some of the ways we can sort of take the square, manipulate it in some way and get back the original square. So for example, I can take the square and I can rotate it by 90 degrees and I'll get back the original square. Um, I can also rotate it by 180 degrees clockwise. Um, or 270 degrees clockwise. Um, and those all give me back the same square. Um, I can even just rotate it by zero degrees, just leave it as it is. And that by itself is a symmetry of the square. Um, I can also rotate it by say 450 or yeah, 450 degrees clockwise, but that's the same as rotating by 90 degrees clockwise. So uh, we'll just stick to the main um, four rotations that we have uh, as symmetries. And uh, there's also reflections that we can apply. So we can also think of reflecting the square along the vertical axis, along the horizontal axis, or along the diagonal axis or the anti-diagonal axis. So it has four axes of symmetry that we can flip the square across. Um, and all of these symmetries can be thought of as a function that takes the square and does something to it and then puts it back on itself. Um, and there are eight of these symmetries. Um, and I wrote them all here. Uh, so these all, these denote rotations by those degrees. Um, clockwise by convention, we just use clockwise rotations. And we also have these reflections. Um, so we have a set, but we also want to be able to, to combine the objects in the set. And we can, we can compose two symmetries to get another symmetry in the set. So you can think of it as, uh, if you think of a symmetry as a function, if you remember from high school, what it means to compose a function, uh, it means 
if you have two functions f and g, first you apply g and then you apply f um, and then you get the composition of those two functions. So if I have, if I want to combine two of these symmetries, say rotation by 180 and rotation by 90, uh, I can then get, I can think of it as uh, first rotating the square by 180 degrees clockwise and then rotating the square 90 degrees clockwise. And in the end that has the same net effect as rotating by 270 degrees clockwise. Um, so combining, composing these two symmetries gives me another symmetry in the set. Um, let's think about what happens if you uh, compose one of the reflections with itself. Um, so you have a square, you reflect it across the vertical axis, and then you reflect it across the vertical axis again. So what happens to the square? Well, uh, in, this, in the end, it has the same sort of effect as just doing nothing to the square, right? Because you sort of get back the original square. Um, so that gives you back this identity rotation, this rotation by zero degrees. And you can also combine symmetries like this. So this means first you uh, flip the square along the horizontal axis, and then you flip the square, and then you rotate the square 270 degrees. Um, that's what this represents. And in the end, it actually has the same effect as, uh, as flipping the square over the diagonal, I think. So that's what it means to compose two symmetries in a set. Uh, and we can represent uh, all of these ways of combining the symmetries. Um, in this thing called a Cayley, in this thing called a Cayley table. So we can read this table by uh, first applying the function in the top row and then applying the function in the left column here. So uh, if I wanna first apply a horizontal reflection and then rotate by 270 degrees, that gives me, that's the same as uh, flipping the square along the diagonal. So we have a set and we have a way of combining all these objects in the set. And in the end, this actually gives us what this wonderful thing is called a group. And a group is a set with an operation that just fulfills these simple properties. And these few properties like give the set a lot of structure that makes it easier to work with and easier to manipulate the objects we're dealing with. Um, so uh, for example, I, I don't really wanna go over all of these properties, but I will mention that every group has an identity. So every group has an element where when you combine another element with that element, you get back the same element. In the case of the, the group of symmetries, uh, that identity is R0. So composing R0 with any other symmetry gives you back the original symmetry. Um, and as well, every element has an inverse. So every element has another element where when you combine those two, you get back the identity. And usually when we apply an operation to two elements, um, you just write those two elements next to each other. Um, so some familiar examples of groups are the set of integers. So if you don't know what those are, they're just negative one, zero, one, and so forth, uh, along with addition, as well as the real numbers along with multiplication. Um, an example of something that's not a group is the integers with multiplication. And uh, maybe you can think about why that's Oh yeah, sorry, R, R without zero, you're right. Uh, we can't have zero in that group. It's gonna mess things up because, yeah, sorry, I should have put that in. R, uh, R without zero. Um, and yeah, there's an example of a non-group which is the integers with multiplication. Um, so that's, 
Uh, that's the basic definition of a group. Uh, you can sort of think about why that might not be a group. I don't want to go into it right now. Uh, you can ask a question about that later since I don't think I'll have enough time, but um, let's just move on to our first example of a group uh, other than the symmetry group that I described, which is uh, the Klein four group. So what if we instead look at the symmetries of a rectangle instead of a square? Well, we have some of the same symmetries as the square, uh, but we don't have rotation by 90 degrees uh, or 270 degrees. And we don't have uh, reflection along the diagonal. Uh, so those don't work as symmetries anymore. So we just have this set of four symmetries and this actually also forms a group um, that has some nice properties that we can work with. So um, we can draw a Cayley table for this group. Um, I, I'll just rewrite the elements uh, using x, y, and z and zero for the identity just to make things easier to look at. Uh, because in the end, uh, the symbols don't really matter. What matters more is the way we combine those symbols. And if you look at this group, it actually has some pretty nice properties. So um, for example, combining two non-identity elements gives back the third. Uh, sorry, was there a question? Okay. Um, so combining two different non-identity elements gives back the third non-identity element. So for example, x plus y gives you back z, uh, and y plus z gives you x. Um, the operation is commutative, so it doesn't matter what order you add things in. Um, x plus y equals y plus x, and they both equal z. And that means that this group is abelian. That's just the name that we call it after one of the mathematicians who came up with the concepts of group theory. Um, the original group that I described, the dihedral group, um, isn't abelian. So uh, the, the order in which you compose things actually matters. So for example, R270 composed with H gives D. But if you go the other direction, you get D prime. Um, so this group isn't abelian, but um, abelian groups are nice to work with. They have some nice properties, which is why we like to have them. And another interesting th fact about the Klein four group is that each element is its own inverse. So combining each element with itself gives you back the zero. Um, so that means that by, by the above properties, any way that you combine the three non-zero elements gives you back zero. So z plus x plus y also equals zero. So that's this is a group that we'll work with in the next example. Um, but before I move on, are there any questions so far? Um, I've just described the basic concepts of group theory. So it was kind of fast. So um, if there's any questions, let me know. But now I'll move on to the more interesting stuff, which is our first example, which is called Peg Solitaire. So you might be familiar with this game. Uh, the objective is you're given this board with pegs uh, in the little slots, and you want to perform a series of moves so that you end up with only one peg left on the board. And you can do that by uh, jumping over pegs into empty spots. So like um, you can eliminate a peg by using an adjacent peg to jump over it into an empty spot. So for example, one move I can apply it here, I can take this peg, uh, jump over it into this square here, and then, um, then this peg is going to be gone. And this square is also going to be empty. And that gives a new configuration of the board. And then I'll just keep on doing that until hopefully I get back just one single peg left. Um, so we can use group theory to um, try to understand the different configurations of the board. So first I'll just label 
all the squares in the board uh, using the elements of the Klein four group that I described before. Um, and then I can look at a configuration of the board, look at arrangement of um, the pegs, and I can assign a value. Um, oh, the, the reason for this labeling, this is a very specific labeling that uh, only works, uh, that does something that we want it to do. So it's only this labeling that's gonna work. Um, but um, the reason why we label it this way will become clear in a second. Um, because if we have a set of pegs on the board, we can assign a value to this configuration by adding up all the um, elements uh, that correspond to the locations of pegs on the board. So, oh, sorry. So if we add up all of these um, elements, we're gonna get back a value and this this configuration actually has a value of zero. Um, you can check that, uh, but I'm not gonna explain that right now. Um, and the reason why this labeling is very useful is because let's see what happens if we apply a move here. So let's, let's say I wanna jump over this peg labeled Z using the peg labeled X. So I will jump over that peg. Now the new peg uh, will be located um, here. And uh, this, these two pegs will be gone. And now this new peg is gonna be labeled Y. So if you remember uh, my description of the Klein four group, if I add up X and Z, I get back Y. So when I apply a move to this configuration, um, it doesn't change the value because I'm always gonna be jumping over, um, uh, I'm always gonna be using two different non-identity elements to jump over each other and I'll get back the third non-identity element. Um, so that means that um, when I apply a move, the actual value of the configuration doesn't change because I'm replacing uh, two pegs with a third peg that has the same sum. Um, so that's, that's the reason why this configuration is pretty useful. And now we can use that configuration. Uh, now we can use this way of notating the board um, uh, to figure out what the, but the possible winning end states of the board are. So um, what are the possible ways we can uh, apply a series of moves so that we end up with a single peg left? Um, and what are the possible locations of that single peg? Well, if we look back at the original board, sorry, let me just go back. Um, using our labeling, your initial configuration actually sums to Y. Um, this initial configuration has a value of y. And now when I apply any move to that configuration, it doesn't change the value. So that means um, any state that results from this initial configuration must also sum to y. That means if we end up with only one peg remaining, it must be on a y. Um, so, uh, these are the possible locations, but we can actually narrow these down further by considering the, the symmetry of the board. So for example, if I could um, somehow end up with a single peg in this location, um, then I should be able to flip all my moves and end up with a single peg in this location but that's not possible because there's no, that square isn't labeled Y. So if I were able to end up with a single peg here, then I should also be able to end up with a single peg here, but that's not possible. So I can't have a single peg in this location. And the same argument can be applied to um, uh, these locations. Um, so this location here, 
if I were able to, uh, for example, do a series of moves to end up with a single peg here, and I should be able to rotate my board and, and end up with a single peg here. So uh, we can eliminate some of these possibilities um, so that uh, the only possible, there's only five, there's at most five possible winning end states and that's with the peg located at these five locations. Yeah, so there's at most five possible end states because none of these are possible. Um, and yeah, I think that's a pretty cool application of the labeling of the, of the board. So what happens if we want to alter the board slightly? Let's just add these four little extra squares um, and uh, see, what, see what we can say about the board now. Well, if we label the board like before, um, so that applying a move doesn't alter a configuration sum, then the sum of this initial arrangement is zero, right? If you take the time to add up all the elements corresponding to the locations of the pegs, um, this initial configuration has, an, has a value of zero. So if I wanted to have a single peg left, then it would have to be on a square labeled zero, but there's no squares labeled zero on my board. So it's impossible to, um, solve this puzzle and end up with a single peg left. Um, so it's, I thought it was pretty cool how just alter it, altering this board slightly makes it impossible to solve it the way we want to solve it. Um, okay, are there any questions about this example? Because I have a few more I want to get to. Um, I'll just pause for a second. So the next puzzle I want to talk about is the 15 puzzle. Um, and you may be familiar with these like sliding tile puzzles. Um, but the original puzzle was created in the 1870s. And the original challenge was to start with this initial configuration and rearrange the pieces so that you end up with this configuration with just the 14 and the 15 tiles switched. Um, so we're gonna use group theory to represent these different configurations and moves. Um, yeah, so like I said before, uh, we apply moves by just sliding these tiles around into the blank space in the corner here. And we just wanna slide all those tiles around to somehow end up with the 14 and the 15 tiles only, only those ones to be switched. Um, so before I get into that, I wanna describe another fundamental idea in group theory, uh, which is the permutation group. And I'll just talk about the symmetries of the square again. So let's take a look at um, the square again. So let's think about what happens if you were to flip the square along the vertical axis. And let's label the corners of the square first. Um, so if I were to flip uh, the square along the vertical axis, I'm gonna end up with the corner that was originally, originally labeled two, it's gonna end up here and the one is gonna end up here. And same for the bottom two, they're gonna switch as well. And they're gonna be, the new configuration looks like this. Um, we can actually represent what happens using a function um, uh, on the numbers, on the labels themselves. So if I label the original positions of where these corners were located, I can represent what happens to the corners by, uh, let's say I have a function, let's call it alpha. I'll represent what happens to the corners by um, mapping uh, the label to where the original 
label was position. So like, for example, I can say that one got mapped to where the two used to be. And two, I'll map that to where the one used to be. And three is in the spot where the four used to be. And then four is in the spot where three used to initially be. So I can represent this uh, permutation, or sorry, this symmetry as a function on the corners label, on the labels of the corners. Um, so that function that I described is an example of a permutation. Uh, technically a, a permutation is a function from a set to itself that is one to one and onto, but you're probably more familiar with permutations as different arrangements of the objects in a set. And that permutation that I just described is sort of rearranging the corners in a certain way. Um, and that, it, I just described that as a function that maps the new location, the, the, um, that maps um, an object to the location that it ends up in. Um, and uh, let me just get back to that actually. So that the set of all the permutations on a finite set uh, actually forms a group. Um, and the operation on this group is the usual composition of functions. Um, and there's other ways that I can represent the uh, permutation. I can use cycle notation. So if you remember my function that I described mapped one to two and then two to one um, and then three to four and then four to three. So I represented that here where like one goes to two, two goes to one, three goes to four and four goes to three. And I can write that as something called a cycle. So one goes to two and then two goes back to one. Um, so I'll close off that cycle and three goes to four and then four goes back to three. So that's another cycle. Um, and I can represent this cycle as follows. So one goes to two, uh, two goes to three, three goes to four and then four goes back to one. So that's another cycle. And these are both permutations on um, a group of four elements so that these are both elements in S4. Um, and this group also has an identity, which is, I'll write that as one, which is just the function where you just map everything to itself. You don't do anything to the elements. You just keep them in the same positions. Um, yeah, so that's the permutation group. It's called the symmetric group. Um, yeah, and it has an identity, which I'll write as one. Um, you can also represent the composition of functions using cycle notation, but it's a little bit involved, so I'm not gonna get into that right now. But one thing, one fact that you should know is that every permutation can be written as a product of two cycles, AKA transpositions. So for example, um, uh, that this permutation that I wrote in cycle notation can be rewritten using a product of three, two cycles. Um, and every permutation is either even or odd. So um, a permutation is even if it can be written as the product of an even number of two cycles or transpositions. And a permutation is odd if it can be written as a product of an odd number of two cycles. Um, so from the previous example, since I can write alpha as um, a product of three two cycles and three is odd, that means alpha is an odd permutation. Um, so it's just important to know that each permutation can be either even or odd. Um, and it depends on the number of two cycles you can use to make up that permutation. Um, are there any questions so far? I'll just pause, make sure I'm not going too fast. Um, didn't you add the, pre the, the different permutation 
in the previous example, I think it was like one, two, three, four. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, were you talking about this permutation? Or? Um, beta? Um, yeah, this, this one was written as one, two, three, four. Yeah. Oh, but then alpha was one, two, and then three, four. Mm -hmm. Oh, where does this? Uh, where does this sort of notation come from again? No, it, it, it's just like, it, it, it didn't seem to come from a previous example. Oh yeah, sorry. Yeah, no, sorry. That, that, I just made up this permutation. But um, yeah, I just wanted to have another example of cycle notation, but it doesn't actually come from a previous example. Um, this is just a function that maps one to two, two to three, three to four and four to one. But this this also can correspond to, um, I wanna think of the symmetries of the square again. Um, this actually corresponds to uh, rotation by 90 degrees clockwise. So this actually comes from rotation by 90 degrees. So um, yeah, each, each of the symmetries of the square that I described earlier can be described as a permutation. Um, where you just sort of label the corners and then see where those labels end up after applying the symmetry. Um, okay, is so now I'm gonna get uh, now I'm gonna apply this to the actual 15 puzzle. So um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna label each of the slots on the grid from one to 16. So we can identify which numbered tile is in which slot for a given arrangement using a permutation that maps the tile number into the slot number. And we'll call the blank or empty tile the 16th tile. Um, and the following configuration, like if you wanna apply that to this configuration. Um, so for example, this one tile is in the seventh position. So, um, the one gets mapped to seven. And this two tile is in the ninth position. So two gets mapped to nine and so on and so forth. And the blank spot is in the eighth position, right? It's in the eighth position if you just count across. So um, that's where 16 gets mapped to. 16 gets mapped to eight. Um, so we can represent like uh, the position of every tile using a permutation. Um, so now the original goal of the 15 puzzle was to apply a series of moves to this starting arrangement and the starting arrangement we can, we can denote that using the identity because this is the one where nothing has changed. Um, this is just the identity permutation. Um, and we want to somehow apply a series of moves to end up with this arrangement. And this arrangement we can represent using this permutation, right? The, it's the same as the original, except the 14 and the 15, or the, the tiles in the 14th and the 15th position got switched. Um, so we wanna somehow apply a series of moves to this just to get to this. And I can prove that there is actually no solution to this. There's no possible way to get from here to here. Uh, it's impossible. So, um, uh, just to go over everything, go over everything again. In each basic move of the puzzle, you exchange the positions of the blank tile, tile 16, um, with another tile. Uh, and the move where two tiles in positions i and j are swapped can be described by the permutation. Ij. So, for example, I want to swap. Um, let's say I want to move the twelve tile down into the blank space. So I can represent that move by writing twelve sixteen because the two pieces in the twelfth and sixteenth spot got switched. And then let's say that after that I want to move the eleven spot, eleven tile into the blank spot. Um, so that means that I'm kind of switching the tiles in the 11th position and the 12th position. 
So I can represent combining those two moves by combining those two um, permutations like this. And then, that, and then combining those gives me the overall move that I applied. So um, I want to somehow apply a series of those two cycles, those two little, those little moves um, to one to get 14, 15. So yeah, if the puzzle were solvable, then there would be some series of transpositions so that um, this uh, equation is true. Um, and I can just rewrite that as 14. This cycle can be rewritten as a product of these two cycles, these two these moves that are transpositions. Um, and also note that this permutation, 1415, is odd because it is a single transposition and one is odd. Um, so this permutation is odd, which means that if I were to decompose this into any um, series of transpositions, there should be an even number of transpositions here. Or sorry, there should be an odd number of transpositions here um, because the permutation is odd. So I should have an odd number of transpositions. Um, but if you go back to, um, sorry, if you go back to the two, the two arrangements I want, the blank tile, the blank space is in the exact same spot, right? That means that it must have moved up and down an equal number of times and left and right an equal number of times to get back to its original spot. Um, so it must have moved uh, an even number of like, um, of moves kind of, um, right? Because uh, it moved up and down an equal number of times and it moved left and right an equal number of times. So the number of times it moved must be even and um, as well, each of these transpositions changes the position of the blank space. So that means there must be an even number of transpositions here because the blank space must move, change position an even number of times. Um, that, that means there must be an even number of transpositions on the right side. Um, but 1415 is an odd permutation so you can't decompose it into an even number of transpositions. Um, that means that no solution is possible um, because I can't, this, this permutation would need to be even, but like it's not, it's odd. So um, the funny story about the origins of this puzzle, uh, this guy named Samuel Lloyd in the 1870s he wasn't the one who created the puzzle, but he did popularize it by putting out uh, uh, an ad that said like, if you can solve this puzzle, I'll give you a thousand dollars, which is a lot of money in those times. Um, so he definitely profited a lot from that because that puzzle was impossible. <laughs> um, if only people knew that they could apply some group theory to be able to see that there's no solution. Um, but yeah, are there any questions about this? Um, so like before, yeah, you wrote 11, 12, and then 12, 16. Should yeah. that have been like 11, 16, and 12, 16? Um, right, so when I'm describing um, the, the series of transpositions I do to uh, make a move, right? Um, I'm describing what happens to the positions not the tiles themselves. So, um, so for example, uh, I'm not when I s say that. Um, so let me just do that. Let me just go over that again because it is a little bit um, confusing as to why we write it that way. But um, let's say I want to move twelve into this blank space. So I'm sort of in effect switching the position of the twelve and 16 tile, um, but this basically means that I'm switching 
the two tiles that are in this in position i and j. Um, so I, I, I'm looking at the positions here. Um, and that means that um, when I'm when the blank space is here now and I want to move the 11 into the blank space, um, I'm sort of switching the positions of the tiles in the 11th and 12th um, spot. So it's that move is represented by 11, 12. Um, so yeah, it, you, you sort of have to, the way we denote it is moving these, these transitions as you're switching the two tiles in the positions, not the tiles represented um, by the numbers, if that makes any sense. Uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm yeah, it's, um, mm -hmm. yeah, I'm, I'm confused. Yeah, um, so you can think of it like, uh, if I were to write this as 11, 16 times 12, 16, um, then the way I've described the permutations here, right? Uh, where the move ij denotes the switching of the two tiles and positions i and j. Um, then if I were to represent it like this, then that would be like saying, um, 12, uh, the tiles and positions 12 and 16 get switched. And then somehow after that, the tiles and positions 11 and 16 also get switched, um, which doesn't really, which isn't really what we're trying to represent. Um, but yeah, it, it is, the notation is a little bit confusing, but in the end, um, uh, it, uh, in the end, the main idea of the proof is that you have an odd permutation and you can't make that into an even permutation. Um, uh, but yeah. Um, and yeah, uh, in the chat, uh, is there any application that can actually solve the problem? Um, yeah, so group theory, it, it says that you can't find a solution in this case, but it there's probably some type of algorithm that you can apply to find a solution that's possible um, to a different arrangement or to any given arrangement. Um, you can probably apply it, but I, I haven't looked into that. Um, um, but yeah, uh, there's probably some kind of algorithm you can apply to. Um, if you're given a certain arrangement, uh, you can hopefully find a solution. But group theory does give you a way of figuring out whether um, a solution is possible. Um, and that, and basically the idea is that if you have any um, arrangement where the blank space ends up back in the lower right corner, um, then that permutation must be even. So if you find the permutation of um, an arrangement and it turns out not to be even, then you know that it's unsolvable. Um, is the converse true? Um, so yeah, it, it turns out that the converse is also true. So all the even permutations, uh, all the even, or all the arrangements that you can assign to an even permutation are solvable. Um, and yeah, it turns out that those two sets are like exactly the same, um, the set of, uh, all possible um, arrangements of the 15 puzzle and all even permutations. They're actually one and the same. Um, yeah, so that's that example. Um, yeah, that, that's an interesting idea with using the inverse permutation. And there is a way of finding an inverse permutation um, using second notation, but it's a little bit involved in a lot of notation. Um, but yeah, you can look into that if you're interested. But um, I'll get into my last example since, uh, oh, I'll get into my last example, which is probably the most well-known example, and that's the Rubik's cube. Um, 
And we can use group theory to understand the different moves and configurations of the Rubik's Cube. Um, and one of the things that we can use with group theory uh, is we can apply it to try to find God's number, which in this case refers to the minimum number of moves required to solve the cube. Um, so first, let's think about how you can represent different moves on the cube. So I, I probably don't need to describe the goal of the Rubik's cube, but you basically start with a scrambled cube like this and you rotate the faces and you wanna have all the faces um, have the same color on one side. Um, and we can represent the different moves of the different rotations of the faces um, using permutations again. Um, so for example, uh, first we'll label each of the faces. So um, there's up, down, uh, left, right, front, and back faces. Um, and each of these letters represent um, uh, a rotation 90 degrees clockwise if you're looking straight on at the face. Um, and if we label all, all the little faces on the cube, um, all 48 that can actually move around because the center square of each face is fixed. Um, if you label all of them, then we can sort of track, like with the 15 puzzle, we can track where those sub faces go when you perform a move. Um, so here's what it looks like to represent what each move does. Um, and these are all permutations uh, in S48. Um, so uh, all arrangements of the Rubik's cube can be described as a product of all these moves. And like, you can see that it's kind of a pain to like actually, you know, try and work with this because it's so many things to look at and it isn't very helpful. Um, so instead of we'll try to narrow this down a bit further. Um, so the Rubik's cube group can be viewed as the subgroup of S48 generated by those six permutations, but this isn't a very useful representation and we can narrow it down further. Um, so since the center on each square is fixed, we can look at arrangements of these corner pieces um, and edge pieces. Um, and there are eight corner pieces and 12 edge pieces. And we can assign to each of the eight corner pieces three possible configurations. Um, so if you're familiar with modular arithmetic, um, we can assign them a number in this group, uh, which is uh, the integers modulo three. Um, you don't really need to know what that is, but just think of it as assigning each corner piece a configuration. Um, because if you look at a corner piece, you can see that there's like sort of three different ways it can be here, right? If you think of rotating it. Um, so the red is here, the white is here, and the blue is here. That's another configuration. And there's like three different configurations, um, but you label the original, the initial configuration as zero. Um, and the same with the edge pieces here. These edge pieces uh, have two possible configurations. So like you can either have it in the original configuration or with the colors swapped in that position. So then we can think of an arrangement of a cube using these four pieces of information. So first you use a permutation in S8 to represent what happens to each of the eight corner cubes. Then you use a permutation in S12 to represent what happens to each of the 12 edge pieces. Um, and then you use a, a vector uh, with eight entries to denote 
uh, the configurations of each of the eight corner pieces. And then you use a vector with 12 entries to denote the configuration of each of the 12 uh, each of the 12 edge pieces. So we have these four pieces of data and combining them, uh, you can think of it as an arrangement of the cube. Um, but we, all, we sort of have to narrow this down further because there's some uh, restrictions that need to be applied. So um, these two permutations actually need to have the same uh, the same parity, so they either both need to be even or both need to be odd. Um, and as well, the entries in the vector have to um, add up to zero because the initial configuration has them add up to zero and applying a move doesn't change the sum. So um, these entries need to add up to zero. Um, I don't have, really have time to get into why that is, but um, we can represent the Rubik's cube group like this um, with a four tuple in this thing with these four pieces of data that satisfy each of these properties. And if you want to figure out how many objects are in this group, there's quite a lot of them. Um, there's 43 quintillion, more than 43 quintillion possible arrangements. Um, so one approach to trying to figure out what God's number is, is to look at all of these positions, all of, all of these 43 quintillion positions and try to figure out what the minimum um, number of solution, uh, number of moves is required to solve the cube in that position. But that's a lot of positions to check. Um, and yet, by applying some other concepts in group theory, um, we can sort of narrow down this huge task and make it a bit easier to work with. Um, so in 2010, uh, a group of mathematicians actually proved that God's number is exactly 20. So that means that any position, uh, any arrangement of the cube requires um, at most, oh wait, sorry. It requires at most 20, wait, let me just make sure I have that right. <laughs> uh, God's number being 20 means that, uh, yeah, at most 20, sorry. I, got, I always get a bit confused with that. Um, right, yeah, a each, uh, position requires at most 20 moves, which is when you see how big the group is, is pretty amazing that people were able to figure that out. But they basically use a lot of computer power to do that. Um, but they also use some group theory to um, make the task a bit easier. Um, uh, so what did they do? So they took the, this huge set of 43 quintillion positions and devised a way to partition them um, into about 2 billion sets of about 20 billion positions, positions each. Um, and then they used um, symmetry to uh, sort of narrow down these sets because um, so that, like, you don't need to check all of them because some of them are uh, almost exactly the same up to symmetry. Uh, and also something called set covering, which has to do with um, uh, another concept of group theory called cosets um, and relating sets in that way. Um, so they were able to reduce the amount of sets that they needed to check. And then they used a computer algorithm to um, uh, solve each of the positions in each of those two billion sets um, in at most 20 moves. Um, and then they basically just use a lot of computer power 
to check all of the possible solutions across the 50, the, but they narrowed it down to um, 55 billion sets or 55 million sets of about 20 billion positions each. Um, so they they were able to sort of narrow down the scope of their um, of their problem by applying some concepts in group theory. Um, and I just thought that that was a really cool application of group theory, and it shows how um, theoretical math and computational math can sort of work together to find a solution. Um, and yeah, that's about all that I uh, wanted to talk about today. Um, uh, if you want to know more about group theory, there's a couple courses here at UTSC that you could take. Um, the book that's usually used in that course is um, Contemporary Abstract Algebra by Galleon, and it's and it's very useful. It's a good introduction. Um, and yep, yeah. and I have my references on this slide here. Um, so yeah, thanks thanks for listening. Uh, I hope this was interesting. And um, if, you have, if you have any more questions, let me know. But uh, otherwise, thank you for your time. Thank you. The speaker. Yeah, are there any questions at all or? So I have a question. Um, oh, would yes. it be correct that they also computed the actual distribution of Rubik's cube in the sense that, for example, they could say what percentage of all positions require twenty moves? Um, I believe. I believe yeah that they they did figure out. If you go to the website um, cube20.org. Uh, it basically documents the, the search for cause number. And yes, they actually did uh, sort of count uh, how many positions require how many number of moves on the site. There's a big table there. Um, actually, let me just, uh, I want to share my screen. Oh, wait. Oh, never mind. <laughs> Uh, if you check out the site, there's actually a pretty cool table that lists all of the um, uh, numbers of moves and the number of positions required for each of those moves. Um, so for example, uh, actually, let me go to that site right here. Yeah, it's cube20.org. Um, and for example, it looks like the most most positions require 18, uh, 18 moves, and that's about 29 quintillion positions require 18 moves. Um, meanwhile, only about 490 million require 20 moves. So yeah, that's worth checking out and that's an interesting question. So I put a link to the survey to give feedback to the seminar speaker in the chat. So we'll pause for three minutes to give you a chance to fill out the survey. It's in the chat. <laughs> 